On the 28th of February 1997, Los Angeles police officers Perello and Farrell were on routine patrol driving along Laurel Canyon Boulevard, North Hollywood. As they were driving past the Bank of America, they saw two large figures dressed in black clothing entering the bank. Both were wearing ski masks, both had body armour on, and both were carrying large automatic assault rifles. Our units officer needs help at the Bank of America, Lower Canyon, North of Kittredge. Officer needs help, Bank of America, Lower Canyon, North of Kittredge. Before we get to the bank, we go back to 1967. Larry Phillips Sr. was just one year out of high school when he was sent to jail for grave desecration, a drunken prank where he tried to dig up a grave and remove the head of a corpse. He was paroled in January 1968, but his freedom only lasted three months. He was sent back to jail for robbing a gas station. After just three months back in jail, he was transferred to Colorado State Hospital which was a psychiatric hospital. The reason for the transfer there is unknown, but after 10 months, Larry Phillips Sr. had enough and he escaped. The date was the 18th of April, 1969. A warrant was immediately issued for his arrest. Once he escaped, Larry Sr. picked up his girlfriend, Dorothy Clay. Very little is known about Dorothy, but there are reports she herself had a criminal history with previous jail time. Both Larry Senior and Dorothy used many different aliases to avoid detection whilst they were on the run. Not much is known about them for the next few years, but at some point they made their way to California. And it was at the California hospital in Los Angeles on the 20th of September, 1970, that Larry Phillips Jr. was born. Except the name that appeared on his birth certificate was Larry Eugene Warfell. He wouldn't be known as Larry Phillips Jr. until 17 years later. His parents were listed on his birth certificate as Barbara Allen and Daniel Warfell. Their occupations and addresses were also fake. Larry Phillips Sr. was still on the run. They lied on the birth certificate to keep the law from catching up with them. After the birth of Larry Phillips Jr., the family disappears again. They disappear until the 22nd of September, 1976. Dorothy and Larry Jr. were living in a small town near Denver. Larry Sr. wasn't living with them at the time, but he visited that day to celebrate Larry Jr.'s sixth birthday. It's unknown who tipped them off, but shortly after Larry Sr. arrived, seven FBI agents stormed the house and arrested him. He was sent back to jail to serve the rest of his sentence for the gas station robbery after being on the run for seven years. No doubt that was an experience Larry Jr. wouldn't forget. By 1980, Larry Sr. and Dorothy had divorced. During his sporadic visitation with Larry Jr., Larry Sr. passed on his anti-police and anti-establishment views. In 1986, Dorothy decided to move to Los Angeles. Larry Jr. had quit high school in the ninth grade and he was dating a girl by the name of Sharon Santos, who would later become his wife and mother to his two children. By now, Larry Jr. had developed a love of bodybuilding. Once moving to Los Angeles, he quickly bought a five-year membership to the world-famous Gold's Gym at Venice Beach. Like so many before him, Larry Jr. had plans to make it big. He wanted to be the next Arnold Schwarzenegger. He was committed too. His trips to Gold's gym were two hours each way from where he was living. But after a few years, he realised he wasn't going to make it as a professional bodybuilder. He let his gym membership expire and looked to other avenues to find his fortune. In 1990, he looked to cash in on the Los Angeles booming property market. He applied for and was granted a real estate sales licence. 
It was granted on the grounds that he passed a future exam and that he would come up clean on a background check. It was the background check that was his undoing. A fingerprint check matched him to an arrest in 1989 where he shoplifted $400 worth of clothes. It was his first and only arrest at the time. His bodybuilding dream didn't work out and now his planned real estate career was taken away. Larry Jr. became down and out. Instead of taking responsibility, he decided to blame everybody else. He came to resent society and its rules. He decided to move back to Denver with his wife Sharon and his children. Larry found alternative methods to try and make it rich. He contacted local real estate agents and went through a number of properties that were for sale. He posed as a prospective buyer. He would watch the real estate agent unlock the house's lockbox, which contained the keys, and then he would memorise the combination. He then placed his own ads in the local paper under a fake name, claiming to have several rental properties available. People would ring him up and he would take the prospective renters to inspect the properties that were actually for sale. Larry would claim the sale of the house had gone through and the new owners wanted to rent the property out as soon as possible. He accepted down payments for rent and security deposits. But the scam didn't last long. He was arrested. He was charged with the scam, but he was released pending a sentencing hearing. Larry was looking at two years in Denver County Jail whilst also participating in a work release program. Whilst waiting for his sentencing to be official, he split up from Sharon. It was 1992 when he walked out on her and their two kids. He didn't show up for his sentencing hearing and a warrant was issued for his arrest. It was back in 1989, while still working out at Gold's Gym in Venice Beach, that Larry Phillips Jr. met his friend Emil Matasarano. Emil also had an interest in bodybuilding as well as an interest in firearms. Emil was born in Romania on the 19th of July 1966. He migrated to the USA in 1976. He went to high school at Pasadena High, where his mother says he was the victim of bullying. After finishing high school, Emil completed a three-year electronics engineering degree at university. And in 1988, Emil opened up his own computer business, selling computer parts, offering servicing and repairs, as well as writing some software. But the business was a failure and never got off the ground. He later married and had a son, but the marriage didn't last. His wife left him. After leaving his wife and children in Denver, Larry Phillips Jr. returned to Los Angeles, where he hooked back up with his buddy, Emil Matasarano. Emil, fresh off his failed business venture, and Larry, fresh off his failed bodybuilding, real estate, and scam endeavors, got together to work out what they were going to do to make it rich. Or maybe a more accurate description was Larry tried to work out what he was going to do to make it rich and how Emil was going to help him do it. Larry had big dreams of a rich, extravagant lifestyle. This is a person who used to drive to rich neighbourhoods and park outside of a house he liked and then picture himself living there. Larry wouldn't bring anybody into his inner circle without a plan for how he could use them to his advantage. He was the type of person that would try and break people down and build them back up so he could control them. Larry was the manipulator, Emil was the follower. He did whatever Larry said. It was the 20th of July, 1993, when they committed their first armed robbery. They ambushed an armoured car outside a branch of First Bank in Littleton, Colorado. It was the start of a spate of robberies that would lead Larry and Emil to be dubbed the High Incident Bandits. They weren't suspects for the robbery at the time. Police had no idea who was responsible. So when they were pulled over three months later, police didn't know Larry and Emil had already committed a violent armed robbery. It was the 29th of October, 1993, when Larry and Emil were pulled over in Glendale, California. Larry was driving and Emil was in the front passenger seat. They were stopped by Sergeant Ian Grimes. When questioned, Larry said he had left his license at home 
and he gave a false name. Sergeant Grimes then asked whose car it was, to which Emil replied it was Larry's mother's car. Sergeant Grimes had already done a check and knew it was actually an airport rental. He got Larry to step out of the car and when he patted him down, he found a Glock pistol with an extended 33 round magazine. Then he heard a thud from inside the car. That was Emil dropping his own pistol underneath the passenger seat. Sergeant Grimes called for assistance and covered Larry and Emil until backup arrived. When they got there, a search of the car uncovered a semi-automatic rifle and a Springfield pistol belonging to Larry, and a semi-automatic rifle and a Colt pistol belonging to Emil. Along with the firearms, the police also found a heap of 30-round magazines, as well as a heap of 75-round drum magazines. Combined, they contained a total of 1,649 rounds of 39mm ammo. They also found 967 rounds of 9mm ammo, 357 rounds of 45 ammo, six smoke bombs, two improvised explosive devices, one gas mask, two sets of body armour, two police scanners, sunglasses, gloves, wigs, ski masks and a stopwatch, two spray cans of hair colour, three different sets of Californian licence plates and $1,620 in cash. They were both arrested and taken to Glendale Police Station. The police were convinced they'd just stopped the bank robbery from happening, and given what was to come, they were obviously right. Larry Phillips Jr. was charged with conspiracy to commit robbery, grand theft auto, unlawful weapons activity, carrying a loaded, concealed firearm, and felony perjury. Emil Matasarano was charged with conspiracy to commit robbery, unlawful weapons activity, and carrying a loaded firearm in a vehicle. At their preliminary hearing, the grand theft auto charge and the perjury charge against Larry were dropped. On the remaining charges, they were facing eight years jail each. The problem was neither Larry or Emil said a word, and the police had no other information to go on. So it was difficult to prove they were going to commit a robbery. Even though that was the logical conclusion, given the arsenal and the disguises they were found with, it was another thing to prove it in court. At their arraignment, they gave a story that the disguises were in preparation for a Halloween party and that they had the weapons and ammo because they were headed to a shooting range. In exchange for early guilty pleas, the DA dropped their conspiracy robbery charges and allowed Larry and Emil to plead to much lesser charges. Larry was sentenced to 99 days jail with three years probation. Emil was sentenced to 71 days jail with three years probation. Both were actually released straight away due to time already served. The date was the 27th of December, 1993. Larry was still wanted in Denver on the rental property scam, but for unknown reasons, Denver authorities didn't pursue him. He wasn't extradited back there to face punishment, so essentially Larry was a free man. It was about 18 months later, on the 14th of June 1995, that Larry and Emil hit another armoured car. Herman Cook was a guard working for Brink Security. He was working on an armoured car doing cash drop-offs and pickups to banks. Herman had just made a drop-off to the Bank of America on Roscoe Boulevard, Winnetka, Los Angeles. He was walking back to the armoured car with an empty money bag. It was here that Herman was completely ambushed, shot multiple times without warning in a completely unprovoked attack. Herman staggered his way back to the front of the armoured car where he collapsed. He was never even able to draw his firearm. His partner, Felipe Cortez, was in the armoured car at the time. Emil then opened fire on the car while Larry made the approach. Felipe was able to get a few shots off. He said he even hit one of them, but it did nothing but stagger them. A clear sign they were wearing body armour. Felipe was also shot in the attack. Larry was able to reach into the car and grab a bag of money. He and Emil then escaped, 
making off with $122,000. Felipe survived, but Herman wasn't so lucky. He died as a result of his gunshot wounds. After that robbery, Larry and Emil decided to change tactics. They decided to go for banks. No more armoured cars. On the 2nd of May 1996, just before 10am, Larry and Emil burst through the doors of the Bank of America on Woodman Avenue, Van Nuys. Both were armed with automatic rifles. After yelling at everyone, get on the fucking floor, Emil started shooting through the armoured teller door. Due to the type of weapon and calibre of bullet Emil was using, he shot the door open easily. He yelled out for the manager, who identified herself. He forced her to open the vault and Emil started filling up a large bag with cash. Larry remained out in the foyer area of the bank, keeping an eye on the customers and other staff members. They were inside the bank for around six minutes and managed to get away with $755,048. Only four weeks later, on May 31st, Larry and Emil burst through the doors of the Bank of America on Roscoe Boulevard, Winnetka, the same bank they had robbed the armoured van outside of, killing Herman Cook about a year earlier. Very similar to the previous bank robbery, they yelled at everybody to get down. One of the tellers managed to hit the silent alarm before diving onto the floor. Emil shot his way through the teller door, grabbed the manager and forced her to open the vault. Two bank employees were struck by ricochets, but they survived. Emil was screaming at the manager to fill up his bag. He was becoming agitated at the amount of money that was in the vault, or the lack of money. He kept screaming, where's the rest of it? And he made several threats to kill the manager. What had happened was that Larry and Emil had done surveillance on the bank and saw what they thought was a cash delivery from an armoured car. What they had actually seen was a cash pickup. That's why there wasn't as much money in the vault as they had planned. Despite being disappointed in the haul, they still managed to steal $794,200. Although there were several marked bills in amongst the cash. They got lucky that day too. The police were thin on the ground and it took them much longer to respond to the alarm than usual. Larry and Emil were in the bank for close to eight minutes. Most other days, the police would have been there by then. But on this occasion, they weren't, and they managed to get away. The police still had no suspects for the robberies. They had a nickname, though, the High Incident Bandits. But nobody knew who they were. It would be nine months before they struck again. Branch 384 of the Bank of America is located at 6600 Laurel Canyon Boulevard, North Hollywood. Larry and Emil had done their homework, staking out the bank, learning the layout, formulating their plan, and observing armor car drop offs and pickups. They arrived at the bank about 9 15 am. Emil drove the white Chev with blackened out windows into the northern parking lot via Archwood Street. They weren't mucking around. Larry was wearing a Kevlar body armour vest, a grind protector, and by using additional vests, he had made improvised armour for his shins, thighs and forearms. His upper arms weren't protected, but he was still pretty well covered. The body armour weighed 43 pounds in total, or about 20 kilos. He also wore a load-bearing vest that contained ammunition pouches, as well as a belt that contained several canteen pouches, which is where he stored his ammunition drums in for the automatic rifles. He also had a shoulder holster, which was carrying a pistol. He wore black gloves with a watch face glued to the back of the left glove. He was dressed in long black pants and a long sleeved dark coloured shirt with a black jacket over the top. Emil was virtually dressed the same, with a very similar setup, right down to the glued watch face on the back of his glove. 
although he didn't have quite as much body armour as Larry. His legs and arms weren't as well protected. As if they didn't look intimidating enough, they were both of a very large build. Remember, it was their interest in bodybuilding that allowed them to meet. And as they had done with the previous robberies, they covered their faces with black ski masks. Between them, they had three AK-47-style fully automatic assault rifles with 100 round ammo drums, as well as two other assault rifles. The rifles had been illegally modified to fire fully automatic. They also had two 9mm handguns and a 38 caliber revolver. Between them, they had close to 3,000 rounds of ammo, including armor-piercing rounds. These were weapons that were designed for war. They set their watches for a time of eight minutes, the maximum time they believed they had until police would arrive. They then made their move. Armed with an AK-47 assault rifle each, plus their handguns, they walked to the northern doorway of the bank, a distance of about 32 feet or 10 metres from where they had parked. The time was 9.17am. They left their other assault rifles in the Chev, along with a police radio. As they were entering the bank, an LAPD North Hollywood patrol vehicle was driving down Laurel Canyon Boulevard. Just on a routine patrol. Pure luck. Right place at the right time. Or wrong place, depending on which way you look at it. The patrol car was being driven by Officer Perello. Officer Farrell was in the passenger seat. After spotting Larry and Emil, they swung the police car into the southern parking lot of the Bank of America and took up positions behind their patrol car, covering the bank. Farrell then made the first broadcast. There was a foyer containing three ATMs at the northern entrance to the bank. A customer was using one of the ATMs when he felt somebody approach him from behind. Turning around, he got quite the shock when he saw Larry and Emil. Larry Phillips said, OK, motherfucker, let's go. Not about to argue, the customer went willingly with Larry and Emil and walked inside the bank with them. As soon as they entered the bank, Emil started firing his rifle into the roof, yelling, everyone down. Larry yelled, this is a fucking hold up, everyone down, motherfuckers. Nobody argued. Although one of the tellers was able to hit the hold up alarm before diving to the floor. Just like the previous bank robberies, Emil approached the teller door and shot his way through it. The door was bullet resistant, designed to stop any pistol round, but it was no match for Emil's high-powered automatic assault rifle. Once he got through the door, Emil yelled, get the money or we will kill you. Joe Villagrana, the branch's assistant manager, got up and made himself known. Emil aimed the rifle at him and told him to open the vault. As they were making their way there, Emil struck him in the back of the head with the rifle. There were about 30 people in the bank in total, including five people in the safety deposit box room. As Emil and Joe walked past that room heading towards the vault, Emil shot off more rounds into the roof screaming at the people in the safety deposit box room to get out. Larry remained out in the lobby of the bank, keeping control of the customers and other employees. Meanwhile, Officer Farrell kept the radio transmissions coming, telling the other police where he wanted people set up. 
officers to arrive on scene were detectives Tracy Angelas and William Krulak. They arrived about 9.19am and pulled up in a parking lot opposite the bank's entrance on the western side. Sergeant Larry Haynes was next on scene. He blocked off the intersection of Laurel Canyon Boulevard and Archwood Street, which was north of the bank. So he had a view of the door Larry and Emil had entered. It's believed that Larry and Emil had no idea the police were outside at this time. They didn't have their police radio with them. They left that out in the chef. There were a few civilian witnesses hanging outside the bank. Tracy Fisher, Michael Horan, and Barry Golding. They saw Sergeant Haynes arrive and they all approached him to let him know what they had seen and heard. Less than 30 seconds later, Larry walked out of the bank. He must have been tipped somehow that the police were there, possibly hearing sirens or seeing a patrol car. Sergeant Haynes made this broadcast. Larry walked out of the northern exit. He casually looked around and surveyed the scene, not looking concerned at all. From his position, he probably would have only been able to see the patrol car of Sergeant Haynes, so it might not have looked that bad to him. But there were other police there, not to mention the large amount still on the way. After having a look around, Larry turned around and calmly walked back inside the bank. Shortly after this, Officer Martin Whitfield arrived and parked next to Sergeant Haynes. While this was going on, Emil had gained entry to the vault, but progress was slow due to the cash being separated into different lockable boxes. This was designed to slow down bank robberies, and it was working. Once he walked back inside the bank, Larry walked over to a security guard who was lying down on the lobby floor. He put his foot on his neck, pointed his rifle at him, and said, If you move, motherfucker, I will kill you. When I tell you, I want you to move all these people to the vault. The security guard nodded. Larry then walked off, shooting his rifle into the roof, screaming, nobody look at me or I will kill you. Back inside the vault, Emil was becoming furious. There was nowhere near the amount of money he thought there would be. Due to the large amount of recent robberies, including the two at Van Nuys and Winnetka, that Larry and Emil had committed. The Bank of America had changed its delivery schedule. The North Hollywood branch still hadn't received their cash delivery. He started firing his weapon out of frustration. The police outside the bank could hear all this automatic gunfire being let off. The call was put in for SWAT to attend. Four shots are being fired from inside the bank. 1540, more shots are being fired from the suspects at Laurel Canyon, north of Kittredge at the Bank of America. Police had the bank surrounded. Officer Haynes and Whitfield were at the intersection of Laurel Canyon Boulevard and Archwood Street to the north. They had a good view of the northern doorway. 
Officer Brentlinger was east of their position, covering the northeastern side of the bank. First officers on the scene, Farrell and Perello, were still in position in the southern parking lot. Detectives Krulak and Angelas had been joined by Officer Zaborovian and Officer Guy in the parking lot opposite the bank on the western side, and there were still plenty more police officers on the way. Back inside the vault, Joe had placed $303,305 inside Emil's bag. But in amongst all that cash were three die packs. Emil walked out of the vault towards the teller door. Larry yelled out to a bank employee, open the door, open the fucking door. She complied. Larry then yelled to the security guard that it was time to move the people to the vault. Larry and Emil had been inside the bank for seven minutes. It was now 9.24am. And it was at this time that Larry burst through the northern door of the bank, looking straight up towards the intersection of Archwood Street and Laurel Canyon Boulevard, where officers Haynes and Whitfield were. Without a second of hesitation, Larry opened fire. First at Haynes' patrol car. The three civilian witnesses were still in that area too. They all immediately died for cover when the shooting started. Whitfield was behind his patrol car, which was parked next to Haynes. Larry took aim at that and unleashed on him as well. The bullets easily ripped through the car and struck Officer Whitfield. Personnel turns one has been ordered. Everybody down, wrap it up, medic, fire. They're pouring in the area with fire. Everybody out, this is officer's up. Shots fired. All units are now at United Advisors. Large shots fired. 500 block of Lower Canyon. Sorry about Angel. Officers requesting help. All units officers requesting help. Lower Canyon, North of Kittredge, at the Bank of America. Shots are being fired. Squad is being notified, call three. All officers stay down. Shots are being fired from AK-47. There is an officer down. All units off to move down, Laura Cameron and Kittredge off to down. Off to move down, Laura Cameron and Kittredge off to down. As Larry started firing to the north, officers of Warravan saw an opportunity. He was to the southwest of him, taking cover behind a locksmith's kiosk with Officer Guy and Detectives Krulak and Angelus. So in effect, Larry almost had his back turned to Zaborovan's position. Zaborovan took the opportunity. He stepped out from behind his cover and fired two shots from his pump-action shotgun. Some of the pellets did strike Larry in the back. One even found a gap in his body armour and struck him directly. The hit caused Larry to stumble, but he didn't fall. He turned around to face Saboravian, who by now was making his way back behind the locksmith kiosk. Larry opened up on the kiosk, firing over 100 rounds into the building. It was very flimsy cover, bullets were going through the walls easily, ricocheting everywhere. The officers hit the ground. Zaborovan and Guy had body armour, but the two detectives didn't. Realising this, Zaborovan placed his body over the top of Detective Angela's, and only a few seconds later, he was shot twice. He started bleeding heavily. We can help out here with the officers down. Yes, give it a good attack on here. Any unit know how many officers are down? We have one. After unloading on the locksmith kiosk, Larry turned around back to the north back towards Whitfield, Haynes, and the three civilian witnesses. 
Haynes was broadcasting on the police radio when Larry opened fire again. This time he struck Haynes, hitting him in the upper left arm. The patrol car was offering only minimal protection. The bullets were destroying it and mostly going straight through it. Tracy Fisher could see her cover dwindling away. She tried to make a run for it, but she was struck in the foot before she got anywhere. She dropped back down behind the patrol car. Horan had also been struck with a bullet. So there was now three people behind the patrol car of Haynes who had been wounded, including Haynes himself. Back behind the locksmith kiosk, Detective Krulak asked Officer Zaborovan if he could run. Despite being shot, Zaborovan said he could. They tried to get to safety using vehicles in the parking lot as cover. But Larry spotted them and unleashed more bullets. They were hit and cut with the glass and other fragments off the cars and the ground. Krulak was struck in the right ankle. They managed to spot a doorway and made a run for it, Larry still peppering them with bullets. They managed to crash through it. They didn't have time to stop and open the door, so they just dived right through the glass. The doorway was an entrance to a dentist's surgery. Also using the cars as cover, Detective Angelas and Officer Guy tried to escape as well. Larry turned his attention to them and sprayed them with bullets. They dived for cover behind the cars. The total time Larry had been firing at the police was about three minutes. During that time, he fired approximately 300 rounds and wounded several officers and civilians. At 9.27am, Larry walked back inside the bank. The police had no answer for that onslaught. One officer put it best when he said, I was in the wrong place with the wrong gun. The bullets the police were using were incapable of penetrating Larry's body armour. And as most of his body was covered with body armour, the police were basically no chance of striking him. Larry, on the other hand, had an automatic assault rifle with armour-piercing rounds that were going straight through the police cars and walls with ease. It wasn't a fair fight. As Larry walked back inside the bank, Zaborovan was calling out for help inside the dentist surgery. Dr. Montes came to his aid. Detective Krulak was inside covering the entrance, just in case Larry decided to come after them. Outside, more and more officers were arriving, taking up positions around the perimeter. At 9.30 a.m., Larry walked back outside. This time, he had a meal with him. They both carried the bag of money through the doorway. As they walked out the door, they both opened fire. So this time, there were two people shooting at Officer Guy and Detective Angelus. Upstairs in the dentist's office, Zaborovian was looking out the window and he could see what was going on. He yelled into the police radio. Officer Guy, into the building behind you. He was trying to direct his fellow officer to safety, but Officer Guy was pinned down by the heavy fire. The bullets ripped through the car he was taking cover behind, and he was struck in the right thigh. He took off his gun belt and used it as a makeshift tourniquet, which would actually save his life. Detective Angelas was also wounded. The police were basically helpless at this point. Most of the original responders had been wounded. SWAT still hadn't arrived. They were actually on a training exercise at the police academy when the call came through. Larry and Emil continued to fire at anything that moved. Despite being completely surrounded, they calmly left the entrance of the bank and walked out into the open. Already wounded officers Haynes and Whitfield were still behind their patrol cars with the three civilians when they saw Larry and Emil leave the bank, and they were actually moving towards their position. 
they made a quick decision to try and protect the civilians and draw the fire away from them. So Haynes and Whitfield got up and ran, drawing the fire towards them. Haynes managed to reach a nearby tree line taking cover, but he was wounded again in the left shin. Whitfield took cover behind a nearby tree, but not before being shot through the thigh. The bullet shattered his femur, putting him in a really bad way. He managed to crawl his way to behind the tree. Not satisfied with badly wounding him, Larry and Emil continued to fire heavily in his direction. They were trying to finish him off. There were now officers down everywhere. I need an RA unit, please help. In front of the building, before the parking lot. Officers requesting help in the building, important parking lot. There's possibly also, also a motor officer down at Victory and Archwood. I need a checkpoint overnight. Rick here, get back. Unit that just requested help. What is your location? The builder's parking lot? Tack alert. We are now on tack alert due to an unusual occurrence in North Hollywood Division. A citywide tack alert at this time until further notice. Media helicopters had started to arrive by now, and they were capturing the first pictures of this madness that would be broadcast around the world. A police helicopter was also circling above, giving updates on what they could see from the air. Larry carried the bag containing the money to the chef. Emil was still shooting, offering Larry covering fire. By now, the dye packs had exploded, but a lot of the money was still actually usable. It wasn't all ruined. Larry dropped the bag next to the chef and grabbed some more ammunition. Emil wasn't too far behind him. They're going to north. They're going to the front. How north? The suspects are exiting through the north front. The suspects are on the north side of the building. They're walking around like nothing. They got AK-47s, two of them, they're dressed in all black, heavy body armor. Heavy body the suspects are exiting the bank on the north side of the building, armed with AK-47s, wearing heavy body armor. Yes, uh, all right, uh, these guys are firing at the officers. Bell officers are standing. As Emil was making his way to the chev, he was grazed above the right eye with a bullet. The wound was only a few millimetres away from killing him. He was extremely lucky. He dropped to one knee behind the chev while he assessed the damage. Once he realised he was okay, he jumped into the chev. He also had a gunshot wound to the calf by now. Larry, though, didn't seem too interested in getting in the car. He was still shooting at anything and everything. By now, a lot more officers were on scene, and he himself was being fired upon from multiple positions. He was shot at least three times in this particular exchange, but none of the bullets put him down. The body armour was still holding up. These guys are getting ready to get it. One a suspect is in the white vehicle. One suspect has entered a white vehicle. Uh, the white vehicle that's uh, uh the, the west the, the white vehicle that's on the west side of uh of the bank. One suspect is still firing at the officers to the rear location. All officers stay down. One suspect is still firing at officers in the rear of the bank. One suspect has entered a white vehicle on the west side of the bank. Whilst waiting for SWAT to arrive, the North Hollywood Watch Commander put a call out for any available officers to go to a nearby B&B gun store and get some bigger guns that would have the ability to get through Larry and Emil's body armour. This is a 
nothing we have that can stop them. To any unit that is available to go to BND and pick up some weapons. They're requesting someone to go to B BAD and pick up we weapons. Tiffany on 10, do we have anybody available to go to BND guns? Hang on, SWAT unit come in. 41 was guarding the BND guns. Several units responded to the call. The store wasn't open when they got there, but they managed to get the staff's attention who were inside. They opened up and the shop owner instructed his staff to give the police whatever they wanted. Larry made his way back to the Chev and swapped weapons. Why he didn't get into the car to start the getaway at this point, nobody knows. Instead, he took a knee in front of the Chev, aimed upward and started firing at the helicopters. Larry was shot again, but the body armour was still holding up. He continued firing non-stop. Emil opened the passenger door, beckoning for Larry to get in. But Larry slammed the door shut. He was intent to stay outside the Chev and provide covering fire. Despite taking multiple hits, Larry still wasn't going down. The body armour was too effective. That left only one place to aim. The call was put out to aim for the head. Meanwhile, Officer Whitfield had been keeping radio contact, but it was starting to get touch and go. We have an officer down Victory west of Laurel Canyon. He needs help. Call three, he is passing out. West of the 170 freeway at Victory, the officer needs help immediately. Two officers who responded to the officer down call were Anthony Kabunok and Todd Schmitz. I believe what happened is they were responding to Officer Whitfield's call. But in doing so, they came across Detective Angela's and Officer Guy, who were also wounded and still pinned down, taking cover in the parking lot opposite the bank. Officer Kabunok grabbed Officer Guy and pulled him up into the car. Detective Angela's was able to get herself in. Officer Schmitz then reversed harshly back out of the parking lot and got Angela's and Guy medical help. It's around this time that SWAT arrived. They immediately got to work rescuing the other injured officers and the injured civilians. They got hold of an armoured car to assist in the rescue. 120 advised units on the perimeter that when the officer is rescued, the uh, fire department has set up command for the fire station 89 and bringing in a helicopter to take him out. Bring the officer when he's rescued to fire station, fire station 89. They have units standing by. Health officer has been registered each other down of Archwood and Royal Canyon. He appears to be unconscious. He is down on the west side of the street. Oh, yes, the officer that's down at Lowell Canyon Archwood is unconscious. <laughs> Shots are being fired still. The officer is down at Archwood and Laurel Canyon. He's about uh, 30 yards north of Archwood on Laurel Canyon. He's behind me about 30 yards north of Archwood on Laurel Canyon. The officer is down unconscious. That officer is behind the tree now. He's got cover. 
The officer that's down has gotten covered behind the tree. The RA is being notified. We're trying to get someone in for him. Everyone stand by. There's an armored car coming in full of police officers. <laughs> Emil put the Chev in motion, deciding it was time to try and leave. Suspect vehicle is moving. Emil drove slowly, and Larry walked next to the car, continuing to shoot at anything he could. Eventually, they slowly made their way out of the parking lot, turning right onto Archwood Street. Larry still walking next to the Chev. Larry walked along the footpath beside a large truck with a long trailer that was parked on the side of the road. Emil continued driving east on Archwood. But officers were waiting. Larry got shot twice more, forcing him back to take cover behind the truck trailer. But Emil was still driving east, so they were now separated. We've got one suspect driving the white vehicle. He's down from the north parking lot. We've got one suspect on foot. The suspect on foot is behind a long uh, trailer, truck trailer rig. 15 out 10, advise you to SWAT drive in and move in as we speak. SWAT is moving in. There's one suspect eastbound from the north side of the parking lot in a vehicle. The other one is on foot near the long trailer. SWAT is en route to 6600 Lowell Canyon across from Del Taco for the off the They're moving eastbound. They're moving eastbound near Archwood. The suspects are moving eastbound near, eastbound near Archwood. Officer Torres had a clear shot and unloaded 12 bullets into the Chev. The shots caused Emil to accelerate harshly, creating an even bigger gap between him and his partner. Larry was in big trouble back behind the truck trailer. Suffering from several bad gunshot wounds, one of which was going to be fatal if he didn't get attended to, now his rifle jammed as well, and he couldn't clear it. He dropped the rifle and pulled out a Beretta pistol and started walking east again along Archwood. Way up ahead, he could see Emil still in the Chev. Emil wasn't waiting, though. He had his own problems, being pursued by other officers. And at least seven officers stood in Larry's path. Larry continued firing at them with the Beretta, but he was shot yet again. He was now suffering about 11 gunshot wounds. The latest one struck him in the hand, which caused him to drop the pistol. He picked it back up off the ground, put it under his chin and shot himself in the head. He died instantly. Larry Phillips Jr. was 26 years old. Meanwhile, up the road, Emil was closely being followed by police on the ground and helicopters in the air. He quickly realised he needed to swap cars, as the Chev was leaking fuel, had flat tyres and wouldn't be drivable for much longer. He was still driving east on Archwood Street when a red Ford sedan drove towards him. Obviously seeing the shot-up vehicle and Emil behind the wheel, the red Ford started to reverse. Emil got out of his Chev and motioned for the red Ford to come back. It didn't. So Emil started firing at it. Be advised, the suspect in the white vehicle is at left. He's out of the vehicle, he's shooting at civilians. The suspect is out of the vehicle at left, shooting at civilians. All of this was being caught on footage. Times were getting desperate for Emil, and a getaway was now looking close to impossible. He got back into the Chev and just sat there doing nothing. He sat there for over 10 seconds before finally acting again. He put the Chev into drive and continued east along Archwood Street. The suspect is back in the white vehicle. He is now moving slowly eastbound between the left and back. He found another target, 
1962 Jeep Gladiator being driven by Bill Maher. Emil started firing through the windscreen at the Jeep and that was enough for Bill to stop and get out and run. Emil pulled up next to the Jeep. He got out and dumped his weapons and ammo into it. He got in and attempted to drive off, but he couldn't get the car started. And it was at this time that a police car containing three SWAT officers, Don Anderson, Steve Gomez and Richard Massa, were flying down Archwood Street towards Emil. Emil was now in the Jeep facing west on Archwood. The SWAT officers were heading east, so they were head on. In an incredibly brave move, he just drove straight at Emil, pulling up the car at an angle directly in front of the Jeep. When he saw the SWAT officers pull up, Emil jumped out and took cover back behind the chef. So there was only about 30 feet or 10 metres distance between the SWAT officers and Emil, and there were three cars in between them. They then engaged in a fierce gun battle. Westbound Archwood. Step five, shots are being fired. More shots are being fired, shots are being fired. Shots being fired behind the white car. Watch crossfire. All units watch for crossfire. On Archwood between Rafford and Hines. Metro is engaging the suspect. All units stay back. On Archwood between Rafford and Hines, air unit advise all officers stay back. Watch for crossfire. Emil was struck several times, but was saved by his body armour yet again. It didn't take the SWAT officers long to realise that if they fired underneath the vehicles, they would be able to hit the legs of Emil, which weren't protected by body armour. Their plan worked. They hit Emil multiple times in the legs. One bullet actually shattered his leg. But still, Emil wasn't giving up. He kept trying to fire at the SWAT officers, but SWAT were winning the battle. Emil was hit several more times and eventually they finally stopped him. Emil collapsed, dropping his weapon and SWAT pounced on him. That exchange lasted just under two minutes. The time was now 10.01 a.m. After 44 minutes of mayhem, the North Hollywood shootout was over. But the scene was obviously still chaotic. Injured officers and injured civilians everywhere. And the police still weren't entirely sure if they had all the gunmen or if there was still one more on the loose. The scene and surrounding areas wouldn't be fully cleared until over 12 hours later. Emil was down, but he was still alert. He was placed under the guard of detectives James Bojtecki and Officer John Futrell. Emil had been shot 29 times. He stayed alive for just over an hour, but an ambulance never got to him in time, and he died at the scene. He was aged 30 years old. A few years later, Emil's family filed a civil suit against the LAPD, and specifically the two officers who were guarding him. The LAPD responded by saying it was standard procedure not to allow paramedics into what was called the hot zone, putting them in danger. They maintained they were of the belief that there was at least one, and possibly more, gunmen still on the loose. It was alleged in the court case that paramedics had made their way to Emil's location while he was still alive, but one of the officers told them to leave. It is also alleged other paramedics were heading that way, but their attendance was cancelled by Officer Futrell over the air. Some people say they deliberately let him die. The LAPD maintain that they were following standard procedure. 
The jury couldn't decide. The case resulted in a hung jury. After that result, Emil's family ended up dropping the civil suit. During that 44 minutes, Emil and Larry had fired about 1,100 rounds. The police had fired about 650 rounds. Over 300 police officers attended in what was a citywide tactical alert. 32 officers in total fired their weapons at Emil and Larry at one point or another. 17 officers were awarded the Medal of Valor, which is the LAPD's highest honour, awarded for bravery or heroism above and beyond the normal demands of police service. A total of 11 police and seven civilians were injured. But by some miracle, the only people that lost their lives that day were Larry Phillips Jr. and Emil Matasarano. Now, sorry, the units we have here are un unusable. The black and white, they're all blown up. All the black and whites at the location are unusable. They have shots fired. 